good morning, everyone. Here's another Zoomer Times TV presentation. I'm Anita Finley. Welcome, everybody. Everyone's used to Zoom, and we're very fortunate to have Richard Letterer calling in from uh, California. And uh, Richard is very, very important to us. He writes a monthly column, and they're extremely literate, articulate, and rare. You don't see this anywhere else. So we're very privileged and we have, we've captured him now on Zoom. So thanks for being with us, Richard. Good morning. Good morning. Great to be with you. Uh, always an interesting time in history, especially these days. Um, and uh, I'll just start with the thought that uh, you switched over to Zoom fairly recently and you just think 102 years ago, how isolated folks may have been not having it. In fact, they certainly were more isolated. And here we've come up with this uh, invention. We have come up with um, the vaccines. Hey, Anita, I uh, got my first and my second's coming soon. How about you? I've had both of them. I'm just adjusting my uh, camera right now. Sorry. I guess so. That's okay. People okay, like you. Okay, I'm back hair. now. I'm <laughs> okay. Right. I uh, got both of them without any problem and I felt fine. How about you? Because you and I are about the same age. Well, it took quite a while for the first. Yes. Uh, but uh, my wife and I, and she's uh, 74. Uh, I am 80, 83, um, but uh, 82 rather. But at any rate, uh, we got ours. I'll get mine sooner because mine was Pfizer and hers was Moderna. I see. And I hope... Uh, and, and it was, uh, I'm sure you had the same experience, Anita, and that is um, you just, uh, a surge in your heart uh, and a cavell maybe for humanity in that uh, all sorts of volunteers, mostly female, directing the cars in the underground garage. Then I got my shot from an active female um, fire person firefighter that's it that would do it and uh it didn't feel anything uh in general you get uh, a reaction more with the second vaccine uh and that's not a bad thing if you get muscle soreness or whatever because um it means it's working not that it doesn't work the other way what's to be borne in mind is that you uh, you probably had a lot of shows on this you can still get it uh, but you're not going to be hospitalized and die. And uh, the uh, chances of your being, a, you can still be a carrier because you can still get it, but the chances are greatly reduced there. Not that you can throw off your mask. I'm going to keep my, I'm going to double mask and, um, you know, I'm not going to take chances for quite a while, but I will feel a lot safer, safer, and that's what humans do. They're terrific problem solvers. So before I think we went on the air, happy President's Day, uh, I was kidding with Dan about how do you spell that? So our vast audience out there, I'll give you three choices, capital P-R-E-S-I-N-D-E-N-T apostrophe S, President's Day, okay? T apostrophe S. P-R-E-S-I-D-E-N-T-S apostrophe or presidents, no mark of punctuation at all. So think about that out there and I'll give you the answer. And actually two of the three are okay. Uh, the one you don't want to do is president apostrophe S because it's clearly for minimally Washington and Lincoln both of whose birthdays occurred in February. So it was initially to honor both of them, but it's clearly expanded. And the apostrophe S, uh, what we call the genitive case ending possessive is um, <clears throat> the apostrophe is two or for whom. So for example, boys clothing, B-O-Y-S apostrophe, the clothing isn't for a boy, and gee, they sell one pair of whatever and they have to close the store, be, <laughs> the department, because they've met the quota. Uh, it's for boys or typically kids meal. 
and I see all the time, KID apostrophe S meal, one kid eats the meal, bing, they can't serve anymore. They've met their quota. No, it's for kids and for boys in my two example. So the two that I would accept are <coughs> presidents apostrophe S, I prefer that, but presidents without the apostrophe, I will also accept that. So okay. there's one of those bar bets that I did way back. Okay. So I want to lead into that into uh, senior life, Anita. And you, how many, how many years have you been active with this group? Started in that, 1990, 30, wow. 30 some odd years, about 31 to 31 years. Right, and you and you were the kind of founder, right? Yes, uh -huh. it was something, as a matter of fact, people asked us, we were not doing that. I was just doing radio and speeches. And they said, we need a newspaper or something. And I said, well, I don't know how to write a newspaper. And then my wonderful husband went, actually looked yeah. in California at some of the samples that, that, that were there. And we, we tried to copy some of them and it was, it's been an evolution. And now here we are, and that's the wonderful. story. Okay. And now, of course, we have the internet, so we we do that on the internet also. I have often thought there should be a national channel for seniors TV. Yep. I mean, you'd have we no were, trouble. We were doing that. Um, I oh. back in um, let's see, probably it was ten years after we started. We had a very big um, organization that came to us and said, "Let's do um, let's do something called Second Season TV." Nice. And we have started to do pilot programs down here. And the president of the university was the champion for us. And he was really pushing it. And then he had a fatal heart attack. And uh, his board didn't want to continue. And we had to sell it. And what evolved was a TV channel out of the uh, Broward County School Board. And they now have a, a major channel, uh, which, we, which they sold all the rights to so but no one's ever done a national tv even yeah. aarp did let me just back that up aarp did have some wonderful many years you know it must have been 20 30 years ago also and we literally the group we that we started we went uh, up to the washington dc where they are to get them to work with us on programming but the organization is so laden so heavily laden with executives, they couldn't get their arms around it. And so it just died. The nature of our business, Anita, some of these things work and they don't, but you lose all the points in life you don't play. I try to play them all and so do you. So speaking of boomer times and boomers, and, and I and, and you are a little bit before them, um, a, uh, we have just had a uh, 78 and two months to the day man become president, Joe Biden. A uh, li little bit of a different kind of president from his predecessor. I won't go in the detail, but what a sense with the press conferences and uh, a lot of, uh, and for me, uh, the important, the most important ultimately is the earth and the legislation that he's working in that area. <clears throat> you remember when I did a show a number of months ago on who was our oldest president coming in the office and <clears throat> Ronald Reagan coming in at 69 years of age, 11 months and two weeks, just short of 70 and more remarkably departing eight years later on the cusp of 78 and before that, only Dwight Eisenhower had been 70 in office. Uh, and that was the last 10 months of his second term. So that was quite something with Reagan. Well, then Donald John Trump came in at um, <clears throat> 70 and four months, so exceeded Reagan. And now we have uh, Joe R. Biden, who has come in older than when Ronald Reagan left office. So I think that's a nice fact for people to bear in mind, especially at a time when a 43-year-old quarterback won the uh, Super Bowl. Uh, and he was from that great state of, let me just see if I can remember that. Oh, Florida. 
right, Champa Bay. My God, look at their teams there. Uh, their baseball team into the World Series and uh, the Rays and uh, their hockey team, I think, won big. And... So where is Brady actually? Where was he? Where did he grow up? Good question. I obviously lived in New England for many years. Um, right. I may have been Californian. If they, I get I don't the know feeling if... it was. A, yeah, I thought it was California, but I'm not yeah, sure either. I think so. so. Right. And but man, did you ever I, see, I, excuse me, did you see his diet and the way he eats and how he sleeps? I've heard about it. Yeah. Yeah. So he, this isn't casual. He no. really, he really knows what he's doing. And so it's not just that he turned that age and, oh, look at me. No, he is such a careful eater, such a careful sleeper, such a careful right. exerciser. Right. So, and, and he turned casual in the causal, if I may just move the U in that word. Absolutely. Uh, LeBron James, you know, who's playing the best basketball of his life at 36, he spends at least a million dollars on his nutrition and his body. And he mm -hmm. gets it back in, uh, you know, in, in spades. Um, uh, absolutely. And the second oldest coach in history to win a Super Bowl, Bruce Arians, uh, 68. And in fact, I loved the... Um, advertisement uh, that they had for the Super Bowl, the goat versus the kid. Now, I don't know if you get that, uh, but just uh, maybe out there for our friends, goat greatest of all time. And with seven Super Bowls, 10 appearances, pretty hard to argue, uh, at least among quarterbacks. <clears throat> he has more uh, Super Bowls than, you know, than, than his main rivals, Mahomes, Rogers, uh, uh, Peyton Manning, uh, he still has more. Seven of 10 and MVPs and uh, <clears throat> this and that. So um, just- And he looks good. And you have to say something about his gorgeous wife. To second that's wife, right. which he's fantastic. Oh my God, a famous model. Right. And he looks great. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, he's a good guy. I wouldn't uh, always throw the Lombardi trophy around in the Bay, uh, but nonetheless. So uh, do you know the price of a pair of e earrings for a pirate, Anita Finley? Do you How know would I you? know that? <laughs> well, because you may have heard the pun before. Are you ready? Okay. A buccaneer. <laughs> right, a buccaneer. <laughs> a buccaneer. So, That's a little bit good. relevant. So, right. what I'm going to do is give a little bit away. Um, so, just something amazing about aging. And I myself, uh, and I'll be 83 in a few months. Uh, and after this, I'm running out to the tennis court. And I am running like on the, I am playing tennis three times a week. And honestly, I can run like the wind, not the wind did. Um, uh, and, uh, I have not switched over to pickleball cause I like the extra running and, uh, I'm now about six, one, I used to be almost six, four, but I can still haul it around. And I hope you notice that I've been losing weight for that. I don't know if you can tell from my face, but I just want everyone to know on the weight loss, I've made a big breakthrough. And I've discovered it has to do with diet and exercise. I bet you didn't know that before. Right. Um, but, but you do now. <clears throat> um, I want to say something about Amanda Gorman, and this has to do with President's Day. Uh, and uh, let me just get that up on my screen here. And this is going to be a part of uh, what you all, um, let me just see if I get the right one here. Yeah, good. So uh, <clears throat> I'm sure a new name for many of you is Amanda Gorman. And on uh, January 20th, uh, this uh, young African-American woman, uh, 22 years old, became the youngest inaugural poet in the United States history when she delivered her kinetic poem, uh, The Hill We Climb, at President Joe Biden's uh, and Vice President Kamala Harris's inauguration. Now, 
Amanda had o- overcome a severe speech impediment as a child. And that's in part why Jill Biden, as you know, PhD in education and an English teacher, my kind of lady, um, picked her uh, and suggested her for this uh, occasion because of course her husband, Joe Biden had uh, been, uh, had, had a stammer, which he's pretty much uh, collected, uh, overcome. Uh, and Amanda, our first U.S. National Youth Poet Laureate. In The Hill We Climb, Gorman illustrated the power we have to seize the dawn before us and rejuvenate our democracy. She didn't cast her poem in traditional rhyme and meter. Rather, she fused free verse with rap rhymes, near rhymes, and hip-hop musicality. Hers was performance poetry, as all the while she gestured expressively with every word she shared. And the brief history of uh, poet poets at um, inaugurations, it was started by John F. Kennedy in 1961. I remember watching it. And that inauguration marked the first time that a poet, Robert Frost, certainly the best known American poet of the 20th century and maybe of any century, participated uh, in that event. Bill Clinton followed suit by featuring Maya Angelou also very well known at his first inauguration, and Miller Williams at his second. Barack Obama included Elizabeth Alexander in his first inauguration, and Richard Blanco in his second. And now Amanda Gord, uh, Gorman has joined these literary luminaries in creating and voicing words that will echo through the minds of Americans for years to come. Then, uh, Anita, are you aware that she did a piece at the Super Bowl? I was just going to say that. If you didn't say it, I was going to tell you, but of course you knew it. Yeah, the first uh, poet to uh, perform at the Super Bowl, uh, a clash that was ponderfully billed as the GOAT for greatest of all time, and that's Tom Brady, 43 years old, and the kid, Patrick Mahomes, 25 years old. Right. Wow. Um, so, uh, uh, and uh, she did the chorus of captains, uh, naming three honorary captains there, uh, including, uh, incidentally, Tremaine Davis, who, a, a, a graduate of uh, San Diego State University here. And hey, before I forget, I was thinking about how new words come into the language, and I've mentioned some from COVID, my two favorites being covid uh, folks who behave irresponsibly uh, with COVID. And of course, after the Super Bowl, we had a bunch. Uh, and Blur's Day, uh, where you can't tell what day it is, you know, unless you check your uh, computer or maybe the special watch that you have. It's just day after day of somewhat the same. Um, and, and that's Blur's Day, but never a Blur's Day with Anita Finley. Uh, that's not true. Earth. I'm glad glad you said that. Blur's Day. There's there are days that I'm a little bit. Is right. this Wednesday or Thursday? And I have to count right. back. Well, what did I do? Right. You're right. Blur's Day. Yeah, that's Blur's wonderful. Day. And again, I, it really hit me when I was writing to somebody about doing a Zoom, and I said, "Here's what I would like. I'd like you to unmute uh, the audience." I'm reaching more people, Anita, by Zoom than just in person. It's much more fun up close and personal, but uh, I'm just uh, reaching more, uh, just numerically and enjoying it. So I was sending instructions uh, to this woman who was going to be doing the uh, tech check. And I noticed on my screen, unmute had the red squiggle underline, meaning this isn't a word. Well, of course it's a word. And it's a word for most of us who Zoom, but yeah. only as of last year, unless wow. you were a horn player. And for you horny people out there who <laughs> had that mute thing, so you can mute and then, oh, no, I'll unmute the trumpet. You knew that. But that's a very small number of us. And yes. the point is, there is just a good example of how we get new words, uh, well more than a thousand a year. And we're well over a million words in English. 
more than twice as many as any other, which is German as second, uh, and then Russian, and then tied for what fourth would be uh, French uh, and Spanish. Uh, but that's just a good example of how we get. And we don't have dictionaries anymore to go to. We have Google. That is correct. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's what very- What would happen, Richard? Excuse me, let me ask you a question. What would happen if Google was no longer Google or they charged and we couldn't go there? What would we do? Well, in my case, I'd go back to the printed ones, which I'm surrounded by, but they wouldn't be up to date. And right. uh, you, you remember the saying, uh, necessity is, is the mother of invention? Yes. Now, invention, is the mother of necessity, meaning we get it. <laughs> you see, that's called chiasmus, where you switch words. Uh, you <laughs> get it, and then it, you can't do without it. And just think of all the things, you know, we, we would adjust, of course, we're good at that. But, uh, you know, just the internet on the whole, my God, what would we do? And yet it hasn't been around all that long. You know, when you were talking about apostrophe S or S apostrophe, there are times when I'm not sure about something like that, when I put the quotes inside, outside the apostrophe, okay. and I go to Google and I put it in and it tells me. Good. The other possibility, and this goes for all our friends out there, is go to Richard. Uh, and that is right. uh, just go to, and actually, uh, you can actually see the spelling of my name, folks, if you tuned in uh, on the left bottom left and it's just richard h letterer and gmail.com uh, incidentally the quotes and where they go just to be very helpful anita period always inside the brits do it outside and i prefer that uh especially when there's just a short quote in there there are many meanings to the word democracy quote democracy and in the u.s dot unquote well I don't like that, but I live in the United States, so I'm going to use it. People will think less of me. Commas always inside and semicolons always outside. But honestly, and my, um, <clears throat> excuse me, if you want to write my address, as I call it, is Richard H. Letterer at gmail.com. You see how to spell letterer. So it really is pretty easy to do. And as a writer, Anita, uh, just just simply word processing, as well as all the research stuff, uh, you know, good gracious. Um, I just, uh, how would I write again? Although I wrote for decades, you know, with just pen and paper and all of that stuff and, and whiteout, we remember those. And oh, co right. co raceable oh, bond. Oh, yeah. right. I remember, well, when I was a legal secretary and I was, I was having to do wills. You couldn't use white. You couldn't use anything. You had to start over. It was it's very tough. intense. I remember that. But something I want to tell everybody that Richard is a prolific writer. He has written over 50 books in all sorts of, for all sorts of titles and, and interests. And, and he makes speeches all over. And, you know, he's going to be 83, but he's really like a kid. And he's just enjoying his life as I am, and a lot of younger people. And that's why I think that that um, Biden was a perfect choice because he's bringing all his good experience and, and a lot of compassion. So I'm glad he's president, actually. Wait a minute, Anita. You think you need to have experienced people in a cabinet, people right. with experience? <laughs> right. I'm learning something new all the time. True. Absolutely. And for me, the important thing is the 180 degree shift in terms of our planet the only one we have right. and it was backstepping for the most part uh the, the last four years and uh of course to see <clears throat> um john Kerry at the helm there a graduate of saint paul school where i taught right there in new hampshire where your cousin and formerly cousins were uh absolutely and the tennis i'm playing uh, is adding nine years to my life. I mean, obviously my game is not what it used to be, but uh, a fairly recent Yale study from the School of Public Health says tennis, you make friends, it's safe. Uh, nobody tackles you. Uh, you learn when you're at net and there's a ball over your head 
to uh, yell at your younger partner because they are younger because nobody your age is playing at that level. Yours, that's called a possessive pronoun. Uh, and you just stay up there. You don't backtrack and fall down. Uh, and it's interval training, uh, uh, intermittent. Uh, there's that slight pause between points and there is that fuller pause when you sit and then cross over and uh, up to nine years, I'm playing for that, for the friendship. And darn it, I have more than 70 years of experience playing the sport, which really helps. I can just, when a ball comes to an opponent, I can just check on the body stance, the nature of the swing and the ability I know that person has. And I'll know if that ball's gonna be out. I don't wanna give that up. I love pickleball, but I'm playing tennis. Well, let's also just um, give applause to the medical society because a lot of people who are playing tennis, golf, and all the sports have had major reconstruction with their hips and knees. And that's why I think people are living longer, living better because they have problems that come with age, but they can be rehabilitated. You look at the top three tennis players ever, and Roger's getting close to retirement. He's 39, and uh, he did have some knee problems. And uh, Djokovic uh, and Nadal are getting toward their mid-30s, and they dominate. Uh, absolutely. It, all those folks out there who want us to live longer, more vigorous lives, and they, and they have the ability to do it. And we know more about taking care of ourselves. For example, we know more about oral health. Tooth decay, uh, back when my parents were born in the late 19th century, and not many people can say that at my age, but 1894, 1899, I came very late. Um, but a tooth decay was, was one of the major uh, causes of death. <clears throat> and on that slight topic, uh, I did this last time, but maybe there are a few people that didn't hear my favorite trick, trick question with the presidents. Can you name six presidents of the United States who are not buried in the United States out there in broadcast land? Six American, this is a bar bet, you'll win it. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. And uh, can you name six American presidents of the US, no trick there, who are not buried in the United States? And the answer, of course, is Jimmy Carter, George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, uh, Barack Obama, who am I missing here, Donald Trump, and Joe Biden. That's right. Those are the six. You'll agree, presidents, not buried in the United States. And there is a writer for Senior Life, Boomer Times, uh, whose daughter was fired on national television by a U.S. president. And, um, uh, and um, that's what happened on national television. I know we're running out of time. The answer is to Zai, Richard Letter, was my daughter, Annie Duke, 2009. Uh, she, as the winningest woman in poker history at that time, invited her onto the show, 14 fired, down the two, Annie Duke fired by Donald Trump a future president of the United States uh, with my wife and me there. Uh, so great for her career. So she came out second, fired on Celebrity Apprentice. So those are oh, two. I, yeah, that's right. I remember you said that. Well, we, we do have only probably a minute left, but Richard, thank you very much. Always coming with such bright news and you're so upbeat, positive, And I, we love to have your articles and like to have you on here. And everyone should know, he doesn't walk around with that big hat on all the time. It's just special for us today, right? You've got it. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and you are worth something special. And, uh, you know, broadcast is an agricultural term. You cast your seeds, uh, your crops. Or, or, uh, uh, but I mean, not a joke. That actually is where it comes from. It I existed. See, I didn't know that. It, yes, it existed. Uh, before uh, radio and television, and that's what you do. So and everybody beautiful be flowers sure. and crops come up, Anita. Right. So everyone should be sure when you 
read Boomer Times to look for our wonderful Richard Letters columns. And uh, if we cut it short, just go into our website and you'll be able to finish reading. It's really worth doing it. Thanks, Richard, and stay well and keep, keep playing tennis the way you do. Get those balls back over that net and smash those younger guys. Thank you very much. Love doing okay. it. Okay. Thank you very much, Richard. Bye. Okay, Bye, everybody. Ball. We'll be back. Balls in your court, Anita. Okay. Thank you. I'll take it. <laughs> that, that's the only metaphor from tennis that we have. That okay. Bye-bye. Dan, thank Bye. you. Bye.